your Bible, if you would, to Hosea chapter 10. Mm. Hosea chapter 10, verse 12, will be our launching off point, and Amen. we'll refer to it a few times. There's other verses and scriptures I'd like to share with you, but uh, for context, mm. let's read at the, at the very outset Hosea chapter 10, verse 12, and verse 11. Sow to yourself in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord until he come and rain righteousness upon you. Ye have plowed wickedness, ye have reaped iniquity, ye have eaten the fruit of lies, because thou didst trust in thy way in the multitude of thy mighty men. Plowing, sowing, and reaping in the new year. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not a traditionalist, but, but neither am I against tradition. And it seems as though tradition uh, would suggest that the first Sunday of the new year, we would want to um, look forward to the new year and seek some mm -hmm. spiritual uh, pathway, uh, some spiritual guidance. Uh, because we seek to grow in holiness. We seek to grow in the truth and knowledge of God. And God's word, uh, I think, will, will put us in that mindset and perhaps remind us of those things which we already know. And I also want to say by way of introduction, we, we sometimes err if we think time is, is cyclical. In other words, well, we have another go of it this year, mm -hmm. and will succeed, will fail, and then, and then next year we come around again. And, and although there are cyclical elements to, to time, this, this thing God has created, I think really time, time is linear. Mm -hmm. And we cannot presume upon God that we will even have the rest of today, let alone an entire year. So even though we're going to look ahead to this coming year, uh, we're not going to be presumptuous and assume God is going to give us uh, uh, all 365 days of the new year. Plowing, sowing, and reaping in the new year. What I want you to think about today is going to be a very narrow segment of this imagery that God uses to illustrate uh, several spiritual factors. Um, we typically think of plowing, sowing, and reaping relative to, to evangelism. Uh, he that goeth forth uh, bearing precious seed and weeping mm -hmm. uh, shall doubtless come again with his, uh, his sheaves rejoicing with him. Mm -hmm. um, but today, I want you to think of a very narrow corridor and place yourself in the idea of being spiritually selfish. Your heart the, the target for plowing, sowing, mm -hmm. and reaping. Outfitting your life, your mind, your heart, your conscience before you minister to others, before you endeavor to do, to do something other than the first works. And I think we'll see today that, that God very often wants to redirect us back into watching our own vineyard. As the, the, mm -hmm. the prophet lamented, he was helping so many other people, his own vineyard, he did not mm. keep. Is this not the Mary and Martha syndrome that we've been reminded of so often? Remember, Martha, the scripture says, was cumbered about with so many things. And she complained to the Lord that the Lord would, would help by directing her sister Mary. But mm. remember what Jesus said. He said, one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen the good part which will never mm. be taken away from her. Amen. She was laying up treasure in heaven where neither moth could corrupt, a thief or robber could not break through to steal, rust would not corrupt. And the Lord Jesus Christ, in the midst of these good works that Martha was involved with, and they were good, and they were needful and necessary in their place. But I think very pointedly, our Lord pointed all who would read the scriptures here in Luke, said, Mary is doing that one thing that is needful. 
So the other thing I want to say before we get into a brief exposition and then some applications or observations about this, this idea, I, I don't want this to be perceived as a, as a browbeating or legalistic, um, non-spiritual, some works-based mentality because God has attached many promises to the whole idea of seeking Him to the whole idea of breaking up the fallow ground of our hearts and our minds and, and of reaping. God has attached, we'll see, so many blessed aspects mm. to this. I, I've heard messages in, in years way gone by, and it's come across as a very sour message. And, and I don't also, even though I'm using the context here of Hosea, I don't want to presume upon you that our context is as bad as it was in Hosea, Hosea's day. We'll, we'll look at that in, in shortly. I'm just trying to use this imagery to encourage us all to think about mm. plowing and sowing and reaping spiritually in the new year. So as I said, we're going to just do a brief exposition of verse 12, mm. and then we're going to use that as a, as a departure point to consider seven uh, applications or observations or encouragement to see what, what God has put here in for us. So first of all, by way of a brief exposition, the prophet Hosea ministered at uh, a time of, of great spiritual declension and decay. Mm -hmm. decay. Uh, Ahaz, Hezekiah principally were the kings. Um, there was a great material mm -hmm. prosperity. Things outwardly were going good. But through the prophet God says that there was this spiritual decay, pagan forms of worship. There was a mixing of the profane with the religious. There was idolatry. And in chapter 1 to 3, you're familiar with this imagery of God using the marriage of the prophet Hosea to, to the harlot and two sons that were born. Um, the one that was not gathered, the one that was forsaken. He used this, this terrible imagery to illustrate how he saw his relationship to the people. Mm. And then in chapter 4 through verse 14, we have, have indictments and, and judgments that would come. And, and this book just includes so many themes, uh, Israel's half-heartedness in seeking the Lord, half-hearted repentance, uh, inner depravity, that, le that, that leached through to this outward decay. Mm. Uh, God spoke of the nearness of judgment, both, both temporal judgments in their history and then a further judgment. Their guilt, their punishment. Mm. And in the midst of, of the darkest days that could ever have been, God showed through these, these bright beacons of light, LED lights, where he held out the promise and showed, illuminated a pathway back to him. He said, in the midst of the, these judgments and describing how bad the nation had gotten, yet he said, sow to yourself in righteousness. Reap in mercy. This is the God of mercy. Break up your fallow ground, and God is going to, if you seek the Lord, he's going to come and reign righteousness upon you. We had, we had a tri tremendous rainstorm yesterday in Tracy where literally the windows of heaven opened and there was a deluge for like 12 straight hours. And God wants to, to have this heavenly deluge into the people that he chose and saved, that, that he paid this tremendous price for. And he wants, to manif he wants to magnify the grace of God in our lives that would not only point back to him and glorify him, Believe it or not, he wants to bless his people. Amen. He said, it's your, your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Mm. And how many of God's people are feeding on the husks, the swine, the swine food, and not taking God at his word, and breaking through with a holy boldness to get the inheritance that he purchased and is so willingly free to give his people. The, the, the people here in Hosea's day, there was lukewarmness, outward religiosity, misunderstanding. And God, again, 
is telling us that we can have this relationship, we can nurture it, and, and he's using this, this imagery that they would understand of, of farming, this agrarian imagery that they would know all about, and he gives us this dual promise. Reaping in mercy, God reigning righteousness upon the people. And he gives his people a warrant of assurance that this will actually happen. Because God, with his unwearying patience, the God of mercy, has promised that the worst possible sinner may yet find grace. The worst possible backslidden Christian, lukewarm professor of religion, may find grace. That bond with sin can be broken. That bond with sorrow can be broken. And God would rain down this righteousness from above. Notice these phrases in this verse 12. So to yourself in righteousness. This, though he's, he's talking to this, this corporate uh, a nation, you cannot miss the very personal aspect, the, the personal nature of this work. So to yourself, you implied will reap in mercy. Break up your fallowed ground. It's time for you to seek the Lord until he made righteousness upon you. It's, it's very individualistic centric. The people in Hosea's day were in no condition to sow to others. They were no condition to understand because they didn't have that spiritual acuity because they were had departed from the Lord. They could not judge what other people needed. They had this beam in their own eye that they had to extract before they could help their brothers or sisters take out the speck from them. So to yourself, it is a personal work. All of us here in this body, every one of us has a, a different history. We're on a different pilgrimage. We're heading to the same spot, but there's all these pathway, pathways that God has brought us on. We have our own field to plow. And ultimately, we, and finally, we don't know the condition of everyone else's mm -hmm. field to plow up, let alone know our own heart, which is deceitful above all else. Mm -hmm. We have our own plow. We have our own personal element in the spiritual harvest, if I can put it that way. Of course, God the Holy Spirit must undertake, he must illuminate, he must help, he must empower, he must lead and guide, he must bring, but there's this individualistic element about the work. And we as individual members of the church cannot just superficially hook our, our, our toe chain to the, to the wagon of the church and be drug along thinking, all is well in this corporate thing when we individually, individually are responsible for the Lord. We must all appear before the judgment. Christ Bible Church is not going to appear before the judgment seat of God corporately. We may enjoy corporate times of, of God raining righteousness upon him in the worship hour, but that's one day out of seven. What about the other six? It's a very individualistic call to break up our fallow ground. Mm. So to ourselves, you reap in mercy. You seek the Lord until he rain righteousness upon you. The nation had been caught up in this carnal approach to God. And God is resetting. God is renewing the pathway to himself. Now, in general, this is not talking about the, the, the grace of salvation, per se. There's several ideas here that we could trace through the scriptures if we had time when he's, he's talking about um, um, seeking the Lord, uh, this righteousness. But, but in general, we know that our hearts in our minds need to have both the Word of God reigning in them, dwelling in them richly, 
producing a spiritual fruit, uh, knowing intuitively that the Word of God addresses every single thing that we need to pertain unto life and godliness. Every single aspect of our life, we can find some biblical principle to, to guide and direct us into that. But, but more than that, it, it's not simply in a mechanical way trying to apply biblical principles. More than that, as God, and we'll see this a little bit later, God is, is speaking to us and, and enlivening us and we're fellowshipping with God in His Word, meeting Him there. And it also has the idea of the works of righteousness. That is, everything being circumscribed and inscribed by, by the, the life of God that is animated in us, causing us to live soberly and righteously, uh, causing us to, to do works of, of righteousness, um, and a view of the glory of God, sowing to ourselves in, in God's way. In the book of Revelation, doing the first works under that, that, that life potential of the seed of God, the word of God in the hands of the Holy Spirit. And that next word, righteousness, sow to yourself in righteousness. Again, not implying salvation, but that righteousness that characterizes the nature of the seed that has been planted within us, that spiritual life that God has given to us. A righteousness that is not, as it was in Hosea's day, hypocritical, ceremonial, shallow, carnal, uh, words and deeds that were done just, just almost throwing them out in a way that it was so shallow. But the righteousness which God begets in us that is the sincere, godly intents of a heart that's been circumcised unto him, according to the truth, according to the fact that we've been made a new creation in Christ. And all those old things were to have been passed away, and all things were to be have been made new, new in God, new in Christ. God has this promise, then next we will reap in mercy. By the blessing of God under this, this imagery of spiritual plowing and then sowing and then harrowing, we can actually reap in mercy. We can expect God's blessing. We can expect God's blessing according to His mercy, not according to our merit, not according to our works. And of course, the reaping is very disproportionate to our sowing. We sow in godliness. We sow in humility. We sow in prayer. We sow with the word of God. We sow with repentance. We sow with meditation. We sow with ministry and service. We do all of these things, and it's God that gives the increase. But God is trying to get his people here back to not doing it outwardly, not doing it according to the flesh or man's devices. All those blessings that God would uh, 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 give, grant in mercy, spiritual blessings, temporal blessing, eternal blessings, they are all owing to those who sow according to the Spirit, not mm -hmm. according to the flesh. Mm -hmm. It's not by debt that God owes us anything. It's all by grace. But He holds out this promise, and He's faithful to His promise. What did Israel and, and Judah think at this time? They thought that God would automatically answer their works, answer their ceremonies. Very, very outward. God was interested in a merciful gifting of his people. Their people in a way of dependence upon the Lord, understanding every day a new day that God was abundantly blessing his people. God's mercy in Christ is described in three ways in the New Testament. It's described as abundant riches of his grace, according to his mercy. It's described as an exceeding 
great mercy according to his grace. And it's described as the grace that is exceedingly abundantly, putting both those words together, according to the mercy of his grace. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. This is what God desires to give to his children. Goes on to say, break up your fallow ground. Fallow ground is actually good ground. It's ground that at one time yielded fruit, yielded crops. But through neglect, Fallow ground is a ground that becomes, through the seasons, the, the, the baking of the sun, the rain compacting together, the baking of the sun. But if it's not plowed up regularly, it becomes very hard. If it becomes not used for several years, you might see weeds or briars growing up. But it's useless to cast seed on a ground that is hard as concrete, which is what fallow ground is. Spiritually speaking, the imagery is of our hearts and our minds, principally our hearts. If our hearts begin to grow this, this thin layer of hardening around them through the deceitfulness of sin, through laziness, through neglect, through presumption, through worldliness, uh, because we've not kept that vital and vigorous, then that ground, that, that fallow ground becomes thicker and harder. I live in the Central Valley and there's a lot of agriculture out there. And you could drive by some fields and, and there's water irrigating uh, the crops, whether it's an orchard or a, or a ground crop, and you see life uh, in those plants. You see people working there. You see wildlife. There's a lot of life there. And it can lie right next to a field that has been neglected. And you see fallow ground. And all you see is death and dust and, and nothing that would ever make you think that anything good can come out of that ground. But if that ground is broken up and irrigated and seed is put in and it, it's being tended to and nurtured and pruned, it will bear a harvest. Mm. And God uses this imagery to talk to us about our heart. It absolutely has to be taken care of. Fallow ground will happen mm. if there is not an ongoing work. Mm. The imagery again is referring to the fallow ground of our heart, a heart that's not opened, it's not unbroken, it's not filled, it's not fertilized with the Word of God. There's no seed sown into it. And like fallow ground, uh, the imagery, it can be overgrown with weeds, with thistles, it can be dead and dusty. So the believer can become, in a sense, humanly speaking, destitute of grace. And there can be the thorns and the thistles of sin. And that person needs to be renewed in the spirit of their minds. And their heart has to be recircumcised. Fallow ground must be broken up before the rain can get in. Fallow ground must be broken up before the seed can be sown. God very pointedly says, break up your fallow ground. And then all these other things can happen. But you can pour water on fallow ground, you can, you can pour seed on fallow ground, you can be expectantly, patiently waiting for something to happen to that fallow ground. Ain't going to happen. It's just not. It must be broken up. A quote, I don't know who it's from, said, Repent, repentance being the principal aspect of breaking up our fallow ground. Repentance and the renewal of the spirit are of our mind in spirit, in speech, in mind, in manners, in our constitution. Is why God gave you a heart to be after his heart. It's the very center of our being relative to God. 
or body, soul, and spirit, but he's honing in on what is what is the motivation of our life? Where is our soul? Where is our heart? The psalmist said, and Pastor, Pastor Joe quoted this in his prayer earlier, when we're thinking about repentance and breaking up the fallow ground of our heart, where do we start? And he quoted that, that psalmist who said, Search me, O God, and know me, and try me. Excuse me, know my heart, and try me, and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the, in the way everlasting. Mm. Going back and doing that first work, daily forget, uh, confessing sins, daily taking stock, uh, self-examination, examining where are we with the Lord today, and daily dependent upon His grace to move me forward. Mm -hmm. And again, that warrant, that assurance of faith, since that is God's will for my life to move me forward spiritually speaking, trust Him for it. It might be an affliction to move me forward. It might be an issue that I have to deal with. But remember that principle in Romans 8.29. God is trying to conform you to the image of His Son. That first work, plowing up that fallow ground, using God's Word, Prayer, self-examination, dependent upon His grace. He goes on to say, for it's time to seek the Lord. Amen. God never says in His Word, He never gives us a precept or a promise and then says, and do that tomorrow. Wait another year. Wait till you feel good. Wait till you feel the Spirit moving you. He always says today, Today, if you will hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Mm -hmm. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted mm -hmm. time. He's always in the, in the immediate. Why do we, as, as fallen in Adam, why do we always say, oh, I will do that sometime. Yeah, I'll get to that. I, I'll write it on my list. When really, spiritually speaking, if, if the word of God came to us in the middle of any duty, the world should stop and we could focus on what God wants us to do then and there. Until it's done to, to the quantity and quality that God wants, then we can go on with the rest of our life living unto Him. Mm. It's time to seek the Lord. God's patience, as the Puritans used to say, God's patience is not eternal. There comes a point when He was dealing with the history of, of His people where He got to the point where He said, I've done this, I've, I've done that, I've done the other thing. I've, Sent the prophets. I've done all these things, and, and now I have to act. Mm. Until he rain righteousness upon you. The plowing, the sowing, the watering, the reaping, all of this, this labor, it can all be applied to the human heart, heart and God's work upon it, and he will rain righteousness mm. Upon us. He will do a spiritual work. He will do a work of grace. He will do a work of assurance, of blessing, of, of that, that righteousness that comes to the child of God when we have a full assurance of faith, as Hebrews says. A full assurance of faith, knowing that there's nothing between us and the Lord. Knowing that we can enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise, because we have we have the joy of the Lord that no man can take away or nothing can take away. We have the blessedness of God. We're living above the world. We're living the way God designed and constructed me to live unto the glory of God. He will reign righteousness upon us. Again, this word came to Israel at a time of great spiritual declension. I'm not suggesting that we are in in that kind of a situation, but I'm using this, this idea, this imagery, as an encouragement to us as we think about this coming year. This whole idea of a spiritual plowing, spiritual mm -hmm. sowing, spiritual reaping in a selfish way that we individually have to walk with God. Mm -hmm. And he wants us to go through this, this system, pardon that word, but he, he wants us to, to get down to business with him. Well, I, I did not do that passage justice by way of 
exposition, but I just wanted to say those few, those few uh, things. And now I want to go on to seven applications or, or ap uh, uh, ex exhortations or observations about the spiritual idea of spiritual sowing and reaping. Number one, there is an inviolable principle of sowing and reaping. That is, it's unbreakable. You, there is an inviolable principle of sowing mm. and reaping. Be not deceived. Mm. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he reap. For he that soweth to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Mm. This is a God-ordained principle. You cannot shortcut it. You cannot get around it. God implemented this in the natural world to reflect what goes on in the spiritual world. Mm. You cannot sow weeds and expect to get a crop of wheat. Mm. You cannot sow tares and expect to get a crop of corn. You cannot not sow and expect to get to heaven. I've met Christians, professing Christians, that will explain and describe a hope of heaven. And there is, there is without trying to judge them, but, but there is n absolutely nothing in their life that would le lead me to think that they're actually walking with the Lord. Mm. Would you come here every Sunday and go out to this little patch of ground, this field, and would you expect to see... A, a, a crop come up of, let's say, corn, and you checked on it every Sunday? If, if you've never planted corn seeds up, would you expect to see that? Of course not, because you, you've never sown anything. How, how can a professor of, of, of religion, someone who names the name of Christ, expect to see a flourishing, <laughs> bountiful harvest, spiritually speaking, of spiritual fruit, but never sow? Never nurture, never water, never cultivate, never prune, never seek God's help. Mm -hmm. The apostle here is, is, is warning us that we will reap whatever we sow. Verse 7, God is not mocked. That is, God, it's, it's a word that means to, to sneer at with, with the nostrils drawn up in, in contempt. God's not going to suffer himself to be imposed upon with empty words. God is not mocked. Mm -hmm. He will judge according to, to truth and according to reality. Whatsoever man soweth, this and only this, mm -hmm. no additions, no subtractions, whatever that man sows, that is what he will reap. Do not be deceived. Do not be lulled to sleep. Do not think great spiritual thoughts if there's no hard work behind it. Whatsoever a man soweth, whatever kind of grain, that's what the field will be. Weeds will not produce wheat. Wheat will not produce weeds. Whatever is sown is reaped. Verse 8, he that soweth to the flesh, carnality, <coughs> corruption, <coughs> ceremonialism, outward to be seen of men, mm. you sow to decay, you sow to vanity and vexation of spirit. What is the inviolable principle? That is what you will reap. No hidden agenda here. No smoke and mirrors. It, it's pretty plain. You cannot expect to, to, to lead a Christless life and go to heaven. You cannot expect to promote your own self-righteousness and then someday be clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Whatsoever a man sows, he will reap. Now here in, in, in Galatians, there's, a, there's an overtone of what the Judaizers we're, we're trying to do. And there's this element of, of uh, Paul speaking about the flesh and the spirit and Judaism and Christianity. There was the circumcision of the flesh that was being promoted by the Judaizers. Paul was holding out for the circumcising of the heart by the spirit of God. Paul was trying to, to, to 
come up against those who are rejecting the, the gospel of grace with their rites and their ceremonies. And here in these two verses, in verse 7, it is seed dependent. In verse 8, it is ground or land dependent. And this inviolable principle will never ever be broken. Whatever you sow, that you will reap. It's God's principle. And if you sow sparingly, you shall also reap sparingly, Paul goes on to say. Mm -hmm. And he which soweth bountifully shall also reap bountifully. It's an inviolable principle. You sow a couple of seeds, you'll get something. If you sow a ton of seeds, if you reap, if you sow bountifully, you'll reap bountifully. The harvest corresponds to the kind of sowing that we do. Again, under the blessing of God. Sometimes I think we, we sow and we wonder, is something happening with that, with that seed? Gee, after all, I, I, I sowed you know, a year ago that. Um, I endeavored this good work a, a year ago or two years ago or a month ago, and I'm, it's still not breaking through the ground yet. God has his mm -hmm. timetable. You will reap in due season if you do not faint. It's an inviolable principle. As you look forward to this year, 2023, have you thought about a year from now, or let's say December 30, 30th or 31st, 2023, the kind of spiritual harvest you would like to, to aim at and, and have God fulfilled in your life? And then have you extrapolated back to today and trying to analyze, now, what must I do? What kind of, of works and grace dependent? And what must, what must I do? How must I sow and reap and break up my fallow ground to get there next year? What did we sow last year that we're reaping today? There is an inviolable principle between sowing and reaping. Mm -hmm. Secondly, you are constantly sowing. Mm -hmm. You may not have thought of this, but you actually are constantly sowing. In Hosea's day, they were constantly dropping seed every day of their life. Mm -hmm. They were planting something. Now again, in their day, they thought they were doing God a service, and they were, they were not. But in this life, our words, our actions, our deeds, our thoughts, our performances, our, everything we do, in, in, in a sense, we're sowing. So we leave church here today, and, and we go home, and we're on the 580 or the 205, and I have drivers cutting me off, and, and I have thoughts in my mind. I'm sowing. We're constantly sowing. That's why God says, set your mind on things above, mm. not on things on the earth, because you're dead. And your life is supposed to be hid with, with Christ in God. Mm. We're constantly sowing. See, that's why we have to be so careful. Mm. Scripture says in Revelation, their works do follow them. Mm. All those, those things that we thought we were doing in secret were going to be shouted from the from the rooftops. You're constantly sowing. And this coming year, you only have 200, <coughs> 243 days. What are you going to do with those 243 days? I didn't say 365. I subtracted eight hours a day for sleep. So now you've already lost a third of that year, a third of that time. And then there's other things that we have to do, duties. Um, and, and we try to do all to the glory of God. But again, I'm talking about you being spiritually selfish, carving out time to spend with the Lord, to, 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 for your own soul to be benefited, so that you can minister to others eventually. But breaking up your own fallow ground, seeding, reaping, watering, doing all that spiritual farming work. I mean, there's a lot of things as you look to the year ahead and you realize how much time you really have. It's not that much time. 
which is why we need to be jealous for that time. And remember, we're constantly seeding. Mm. Thirdly, sowing, plowing, reaping is hard work. Mm. It, it's really hard work. No easy believism here. Mm. No, no let go and let God do it. No 40 days of a, of a purposeful, purposeful life and then I'll just kind of be on a glide path to get me into heaven. It's, it's labor. This is why Paul said, I, I labor more abundantly than you all. I think, I think Paul had the Martha and the, the Mary aspect in his life. But he labored more abundantly. He brought his body under subjection so that by any means he would not preach to others and himself become a castaway. If you think about a farmer, um, it, it, it's burning muscles, it's, it's dust and grime, it's sweat, it's, it's endless hours, it's, there's no instant gratification. I was raised in a generation that said hard work was, was noble, mm. hard work was admirable. I never would have thought to be, I think I'll be an influencer on social media. Hard work is what the farmer did. Now, I'm no farmer. I'm a, I'm a suburbanite, but I was raised on an acre and a half piece of ground, and we did some itinerant farming and, and growing stuff. And I, I've run a rototiller on hard ground, and I've used a shovel and a hoe extensively, and I've put up fencing, and I've had to improvise broken things on the spot. And uh, there was, I remember one time we, we worked well past midnight because we had an issue with our septic tank and our leech line. And all of that was hard work. Again, I'm not a farmer. I'm a suburbanite. But this imagery reminds us that we have to, we can't put our hand to the plow and, and then look back because it's difficult, because it's hard. Think of the other imageries of being a Christian, the metaphors, being a soldier, running a marathon, fighting, being a laborer, mm. being a farmer. If someone told you that the Christian life was easy, they were wrong. That's right. If they told you it can be defined in 40 days, encapsulated and summarized, they were wrong. If they told you, as we heard a few weeks ago from our pastor, that you can be a Christian and carnal at the same time, they were vastly mistaken. Sowing, reaping, mm. plowing is hard work. Fourthly, Hindrances to this activity have got to be overcome. Mm -hmm. There will be hindrances. Listen to the wisest man who ever lived. He said this, He that observeth the wind will not sow. Mm -hmm. And he that regardeth the clouds will not mm -hmm. reap. As thou knowest not what is the way of the spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. In the morning, sow thy seed. And in the evening, withhold not thine hand, for thou knowest not whether shall, whether shall prosper, either this or that, or whether they both shall be good alike. If you regard the wind, if you regard the rain, the rain you will not sow. I think the principle is reminding us that There'll be times when there'll be affliction, spiritual warfare, besetting sin, lack of faith, uh, looking at the outward appearance, discouragements from all sides, and they have to be overcome. I might even say that a hindrance might be some victory. Some place where we get to an elevated spiritual position and we'll think, I got it. I'm there with the Lord. Everything is great. And that might be a genuine place where we're at. But that's no cause or reason to then rest and relax and coast. Amen. John Gill said this, he said, unforeseen events come from God. And the man who is always gazing on the uncertain future, he will neither begin nor complete any useful work, any useful heart work. But bear in mind this, the times and circumstances, the power of nature, all of these things, they minister in the hand of God. 
God is doing it. We cannot attempt to provide a quick stamp definition of this issue as a reason to not get on with the business of knowing God and elevating our fellowship with Him and walking with Him. The sluggard, uh, Proverbs 20, the sluggard will not plow by reason of the cold. Therefore, in the harvest, he'll be, be a beggar. Again, it's that inviolable principle. We each have common hindrances. We each have unique hindrances. They must be removed. They must be overcome. We must have a that, that overcoming power of a living faith to believe God at his word. Do not be weary in well-doing, for in due season, God's season, we will reap if we faint not. Fifthly, sowing and reaping and plowing require patience. Patience. James 5, verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Here's the imagery. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and he has long patience for it until he received the early and the latter rain. Two words both translated as patience, endurance and patience. Mm -hmm. Without being farmers, you can imagine the whole work requires patience. That whole sequential process mm -hmm. from going from, from a bare field to a bountiful harvest, that whole sequence of events requires patience and diligence at, at every step of the way. Be patient, brethren, mm. for the fruit of the earth. In this life, we will definitely get tokens of that harvest. Tokens here. Heaven, of course, will be the full and final harvest. Here we must labor and toil. There, there is rest. Sixthly, when righteousness is the seed, mm -hmm. happiness is the harvest. And this is what God said in Proverbs verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 18. The wicked worketh a deceitful work, but to him that soweth righteousness, there shall be a sure reward. Amen. A sure reward that stands over and against and in contrast and in high relief to those who are sowing to the flesh. God is almost saying, try me. Prove me mm -hmm. this year. This reward, this blessing, this joy, this fellowship, it's not a, a debt, but it's of grace. It's linked to this free promise and mercifully linked to the Christian's perseverance. It's this principle of spiritual life. Some sow to the flesh, they sow vanity, they'll reap vanity, vexation of spirit, go down the list. But the one that sows to righteousness and sows in and for righteousness, there will be the sure reward. Sowing righteousness is never lost labor. The seed may disappear for a while beneath the soil, it will spring up. Sometimes we have to have to persevere for quite a while, but again, we will reap if we faint not. Paul told Timothy, godliness is profitable for all things, having the promise of this life that now is, and also of that which is to come. I think it was John Gill who said this, I'm going to mention this again, but he says, one reward of the truth that we receive from God's table is a enduring seed of truth. So, for example, we are sowing into our life the word of God in, in wanting it to dwell in us richly and deeply. John Gill says, actually what happens is it like self-germinates by way of multiplication. So, In other words, it's not a a one-for-one one thing where a seed is sown and it, it brings up a piece of spiritual fruit and we rejoice in that. 
He says it's a multiplication factor because the seed is like constantly re-germinating and super-germinating itself to, to branch out into other areas of our life. This is the nature, he says, of God's Word. It's multifaceted, spiritual, and eternal. It's not as we think of, of a one-to-one -one correspondence. The labor of the godless is very selfish, very narrow-minded, very small in scope, so opposite of what the labor of, of God's children are achieve, trying to achieve or aiming at, laying up treasure in heaven. Mm -hmm. Seven, reaping harvesting, sowing, has, again, this multiplication factor. So here, think about this. If you plant a single seed, a single grain of corn, what comes up? A, a corn plant that is six feet, seven feet tall, it has many ears of corn on it, and each of those ears has hundreds of kernels that could be sown again. There is this multiplication factor. We sow with handfuls, but we reap bushful, uh, bosomfuls, bushels. There's a multiplication factor. This is why Jesus said when we reap, some reap a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, mm -hmm. some thirtyfold. Think about this. I, I was thinking about this verse in, in Corinthians. And I think it describes the spiritual nature of, har of mm -hmm. sowing and reaping. I think this, he's talking about the resurrection, but I think it's reinforcing what happens when we spiritually sow and reap. Mm -hmm. He says this, And thou which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear grain. It may of chance be wheat, or some other grain, mm -hmm. but God giveth it a body, as it has pleased him, and to every seed his mm -hmm. own body. So when we think about the resurrection, mm -hmm. we don't even know, I mean, we know that this body is corrupt and God is going to raise it as a glorious body. But here this imagery is, 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 is telling us, so you're planting a seed, you don't even know to the extent of what it is. But God is going to quicken it and give it a body as it pleased Him. And, and I think this, this very aptly illustrates this, this principle that there is this multiplication factor 60-fold, 30-fold, 100-fold. It goes far beyond what we expect, far beyond what we can imagine because it's God who is giving the increase. We're tempted to think and, and, and so very much limit God's, God's work in our life to bring about a spiritual harvest. I think God wants to do, and God's promises indicate there is much more that can be done. Plowing, sowing, and reaping in this new year. Will we, will we be up for the task? Will we set our mind on things above? Will we realize that there's this inviolable principle of sowing and reaping? And, and take God at his word and, and look forward to the reaping. Mm -hmm. Will we be reminded that we're constantly sowing? We're dropping seeds everywhere we go in our thoughts, words, and actions. Will we set our face like a flint, I'm reminding us that sowing and reaping is hard work. There will be hindrances. Those hindrances are not to stop us up, they are to be overcome. We must have patience. When righteousness is the seed, when we are sowing to the Spirit, we will of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Happiness is the harvest. And then there is this multiplication factor. How much time do we have in this coming year? Well, we, we do not know. 
some of us may have gone on to our reward tomorrow, let alone next year. Time is really, really very short. Let me close with this very brief poem that Pastor Downing, years ago I was listening to a message he preached on, from Ecclesiastes talking about the brevity of time. And he had in his Bible as a child been given this, this poem and he kept it. And for some reason it, it made an impact upon me because it is so short, but, but it's a very sober uh, uh, truth and very realistic, mm -hmm. profound truth. It says simply this, when as a babe I cried and slept, mm -hmm. time crept. When as a boy I played and talked, time walked. When I became a man, time ran, and soon I'll find as I journey on, time gone. That quickness of time, that brevity of our life, only one life will soon be passed, and only what's done for Christ will last. Amen. Let's be spiritual farmers in 2023. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and the encouragement to spiritually break up our fallow ground on a daily basis so it doesn't get any worse, deeper or thicker. Thank you for the promise of sowing in righteousness, reaping in mercy, that you will rain righteousness down upon us. Oh, we yes. want to be spiritual farmers in the coming mm -hmm. year. Help us to have this niche, this, this very narrow mm -hmm. um, segment of, of being, again, spiritually selfish, as it were, so that we can be of better service yes. to others. Um, keeping our own vineyard, um, employing the, the Mary uh, 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 idea more often than we do. Mm. And would you not be pleased to show us the validity and the truth, truth of this tremendous promise? Thank you, our Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.